It's time for Windows Weekly, and wow, there is a lot, believe it or not, at the end of the year, a lot of news. Microsoft completely changing the way Edge works. Windows 10 19 H1 is coming soon. A new Snapdragon just for Windows. And, oh my goodness, could it be a big update for Notepad? It's all coming up next on Windows Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Windows Weekly with Paul Theron and Mary Jo Foley. Episode 599. Recorded Wednesday, December 12th, 2018, Inside Clippy. Windows Weekly is brought to you by LastPass. Secure every password-protected entry point to your business. Join over 43,000 businesses and start managing and securing your company's passwords today. Learn more at lastpass.com slash twit. And by Molecule. Molecule is the world's first molecular air purifier that reduces symptoms for allergy and asthma sufferers. For $75 off your first order, visit Molecule.com and use the promo code TWIT75. It's time for Windows Weekly, the show where we cover the latest news from the Microsoft arena. Sometimes we call it the Chris Capicella Show. Is he coming on later? Now it's in the, the uh... Dunkin' Donuts Arena. Leo, get with the program. <laughs> <laughs> the Dunkin'. Uh, did they rename it the Dunkin' Arena? Did they take the donuts? Yeah, there out is the... a the, uh, Providence has a Dunkin' Donuts. Yeah, and I'm wondering center or something. Yeah, there. which is a great place to go. The whole place smells like donuts the whole time. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. <laughs> yep, that's the point. <laughs> it is. Uh, it is episode 599. We're in a race. To get to episode yep. 600 before the year ends. We're going to make it. We're going to make it. We're going to make it. Yeah. Next week. Mm -hmm. Are we off like the week of Christmas and New Year's? Is that how this works? Yeah, I think so. We have Christmas a best sure. of on the 26th, Boxing Day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Boxing um, Day. And I don't know. I think uh, Alex probably knows, but I would bet that we're here one uh, January 2nd. Unless you yeah. really yeah. don't want to. We'll just have to make some things up to talk about. Won't be anything to say. <laughs> well, you can do your yeah. look ahead or your best predictions. Of. That's true. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. You know, it can be a very short show if you want. I don't. I'm not looking at you. You never 17, know. It, it, a minutes. lot could happen. Who knows? That's true. This past week was actually kind of nuts. It was. See, Leah, while you were gone. Yes. By the way, thanks happened. to uh, Megan for filling in uh, for she, me last. She did week. a great job. Yeah. But I'm back. While baby. you were gone and after Megan was here, stuff happened. Really? Yep. Well, let's get right down to it. What's going on? <laughs> That's Paul Thorat, by the way, on your left. We should pan <laughs> I should pan you left. Let me let me set the settings here. I'll pan I'll pan Paul left. We're gonna make him be in the left channel. Okay. Oh, you're actually gonna pan me. You mean in yeah. an audio sense? Yeah. Yeah. I thought. Why oh, not? If you're do wondering this? what that little voice in your ear is, <laughs> say, "Do it, do it." <laughs> it's, it's me. And I'm gonna pan. Uh oh, I can't get out. What did I do? <laughs> oh crap. Uh, oh. oh, there we go. And I'm gonna right. pan. You can't Mary get Joe. Mary Joe out of the middle. Right. I'm always in the middle. <laughs> now, for those of you in stereo. Yeah. Sorry. Paul Thorat on the left, Mary Jo on the look right. Over here. Look, look at me. <laughs> <laughs> is at Thorat.com, oddly enough. He also uh, publishes uh, the Field Guide to Windows 10, among other fine volumes of fiction, at leanpub.com. <laughs> right. Actually, at this point, they're pretty much just uh, historical <laughs> <Yeah>. docudramas. <laughs> yeah. Mary Jo Foley writes regularly about Microsoft on ZDNet. Easy to find her blog, all about Microsoft.com. Can uh, uh, let me ask the chat room? Can you hear the stereo separation, or should I make it more extreme? We're very also, extreme it, people, so yeah. Is it awesome or it? is it annoying? No, it's awesome. I didn't. I didn't go like all the way to the left. So it's not like the first <laughs> Van Halen album. <laughs> no, <laughs> like like where they had really terrible. You know, like let's just put the guitar over there. <laughs> Should pan Paul a little more to the left. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> to Mary Joe asked quietly asked for some more separation. <laughs> separate Could you separate us as far apart? <laughs> we we actually have different monitors on, on different good. sides of the room. <laughs> no, this is what happened. Karsten Lennon doesn't like it. Are you deaf uh, in one ear? Just for some reason, it, it, it bugs him. No. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Actually, yeah. Actually, there, there's a ringing sound in my left. I don't know. What <laughs> anyway, uh, the peanut gallery has all weighed in now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to uh, guess and say opinions are all over the map. Opinions vary. Yes. I guess what I'm going to do is turn it down. Maybe I turned it up too much and made it be extreme. So I'm just going to do it a slight, but then it'll feel like we're sitting around a table. Sure. Yeah. We are. Like a virtual those, table. Uh, those 3D audio books, like they would have a, yeah. like a fly would buzz around in a circle and you could hear it. And then I'm going to put Brad Sam's, I don't know where him, he's going to. Speaking of flies buzzing. <laughs> through. <laughs> so, so uh, you said things happened while I was uh, gone. Yeah. What? Well, the biggest one was rumors were correct. Microsoft Edge is going to become a oh. Chromium-based browser. That was huge, you, right? Or, or huge, as the case may be. Huge. That was huge. <laughs> it was huge, you guys. Um. <laughs> So is that Microsoft throwing? Did, you didn't talk about this last week. This happened after the show, right? So we we talked about the rumors the rumor. about it, well, they confirmed but it. not the actual happening, which was the day after Windows Weekly. Yeah, yeah. Um, is it thrown in the towel? I guess it is. They even said it. It kind of yeah. is. We give up. Yeah, it is. Well, but it is. But I think to the right cause, right? Uh, this yeah. isn't. Uh, you know, we made this product nobody used, and we're not going to make it anymore. It's. You know, maybe this isn't the right place to innovate on the web yeah. with a rendering engine. And uh, this is a thing that people still are kind of arguing about. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, the way we had described it last week was that, you know, Microsoft, like any other browser maker, can innovate at the application level, which right. is, I think, the appropriate place to do it, not at, at the yeah. web standards level. Well, and that's one argument for this is, is this is good for PWAs, right? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Electron apps and... Yeah. yeah, and they own GitHub, which created Electron, and so now mm -hmm. that, that means yeah. Electron. But uh, somebody said yesterday, I thought this was interesting, mm -hmm. um, as the Chromium engine is not, is a forked version of WebKit. It's called Blink. Mm -hmm. right. right. Why not choose WebKit? Then you would be, because WebKit's on iOS, WebKit's on Mac. Yeah. yeah. It's, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, Chromium, Chrome used to be WebKit until they forked it not so long ago. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think they wanted to go with the standard, de, de facto here's standard. Here's what I don't like about that. And this is funny, but it's true. It makes yeah. it a monoculture. It does. It gives Google it does, more power. But, but again, I, I think that's where the monoculture needs to be, right? Yeah. We're not all using the same yeah. application, right? although two-thirds of people on the web are using Chrome. Um, we're using the rendering engine and, um, mm -hmm. and the JavaScript engine and the other things that make up Chromium. But I... Again, I, I think that's the right place for that to be, you know, because calling it a monoculture, you know, is um, has the, this negative connotation to it, right? It's like, it's like the bananas. word bias. It, like, you know, well, mm -hmm. not, not like bananas, unless you don't like bananas. <laughs> well, bananas um, are a monoculture, and that means disease can wipe them out. Yeah, <laughs> and that's, that's what I mean. It's a that's, negative. That's the negative. negative connotation, and that. But I think that's true in, in, in a browser, in a sense, right? Because mm -hmm. that means. Any exploit of Chromium will be now uh, well, but, even more broadly spread. But any standard is a monoculture. That's the you know no, the, the positive way to look at it is uh, this is a standard. It's a standard. So the pro Leo, Leo's familiar with all of It's not a standard set by the W3C. It's a standard set by a corporation, or it's is it? Because it's open. Standard. It is open source. Yeah. Open source. Yeah. Um, technically, Microsoft could fork Chromium. But that would kind of defeat the purpose yeah, no, in a way not, of going to be, Chromium. Uh, right? if, if, right by the way, if that happens, something went horribly wrong. Exactly. So yeah. Chromium is the open source project uh, upon which Chrome is based. Correct. Yeah. And a lot of other browsers, not just Anything Chrome. Anything with Electron is based. And if you use uh, Linux, you can download Chrome, but you can also download Chromium mm -hmm. as, as a browser itself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think you can get Chromium on Windows. Can I you presume you can, can yeah. Yeah. Mm. What's the difference between Chrome and Chromium? Google tracking, <laughs> probably. Um, uh, no, Chromium I does think the tracking too. Adobe, um, what's in there? Something from Adobe is in Chrome that's not in Chromium. Oh, patent, st patent encumbered stuff might be in Chrome. Yeah. Um, there's it, There are differences between the two. Um, yeah. But I, you know, I, I go back, to, I, I agree with Paul on this that I think they had to throw in the towel because developers weren't testing for 
edge right. because it wasn't based on Chromium. And the result was there were many JavaScript heavy pages and sites that wouldn't work correctly and sometimes almost at all in edge. It's also you, like I mean, a lot of, go ahead, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, what good's a browser? Even if it's a, the most standards compliant browser, if yeah. people don't use it. And it, right. right. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. And it, it's a lot of effort and, and uh, money and resources mm -hmm. directed at something that the end user never benefits from unless you do it yeah. perfectly. And then they don't notice. Exactly. You know, right. it, it, it's it's a terrible thing to have to work on if it's unnecessary. And I, I know, you know, for Microsoft, because there's a mentality there that they make things and mm -hmm. we've always done it this way. And um, this is not the right place for them to be expending effort. And it's easier for developers if there's a single or at least a, a couple of targets to hit. Um, mm -hmm. rather than dozens, which, like Mary just said, they're not doing anyway because Edge has 3 or 4% yep. usage share. So why bother? Right. Yep. Will they... And, but the other thing, Leo, did you hear... You probably heard this. They're also bringing Edge as part of this to Windows 7, 8.1, yeah. and the Mac. Yeah. Um, which it's already is on iOS and Android, but now it'll be right. on uh, Macintosh, too. There's also mm -hmm. a small hint it might even come to Linux, which is kind of crazy. Um, they never really? said that, but... Yeah, because if you look at the way they worded it, they said we're going to bring it to other platforms too, like Mac OS. That's true. Um, That's true. It, it, it's a subtle hint, I know, and I'm not saying it's definitely going to happen, but it's it's a possibility. Here's yeah. and the, the one, oh, Go ahead. Yep. No, I, well, I was just going to this real quick. I mean, I, I think there is a, a market, especially in this space and time, for a version of Google of uh, Chrome that has the Google stuff removed. You know. And uh, that's something Microsoft could do. I know Opera does it. Brave is a really small company. They do it. There are other companies, I'm sure, they are based their browsers well, on Chromium. And there's, but of course, all these Electron apps as well, which yeah. are basically a, a Chromium built into an app mm -hmm. to provide. So the yeah. app is JavaScript and HTML. What happens right. to Edge? I use Edge as my uh, default PDF reader in Windows. What happens to that? Because yeah. Chromium does not have – those are that's one of the proprietary <laughs> things I think that Google mm -hmm. might add, but Chromium doesn't have. I guess Microsoft um, could keep its renderer. So they're not keeping the rendering engine in the browser. They're actually right. keeping um, Edge HTML and the Chakra JavaScript engine for apps, but they're not keeping yep. them for the browser. So they're not completely just killing them. But um, they also hinted that they're going to take some things from the current version of Edge and make them, or at least try to get them adopted as part of Chromium. Right. And then they can also add their own Chrome with a small C on top of Chromium, right? That's what so, you do if you're a good uh, open source uh, right. uh, mm -hmm. user is you, is you contribute back, and Microsoft said they are mm -hmm. going to do that. So that means now both think, Google and Microsoft will be contributing back to the, the Chromium yeah, project, and I think is this great. is the key. This is the key thing. And for the people who are afraid of what this means in a negative way for Microsoft or Edge, I would just say there's no reason that the version of Edge based on Chrome can't look and work exactly like the one we have today. So if you're worried about that stuff, I'm not saying it will happen, yeah. but it's likely it will just for is continuity really purposes. I'm not saying anyone well, is, but <laughs> no, no, there, some people there, are, obviously, no, there are some features in Edge people like, like you just mentioned well, like the PDF reader. PDF reader right? is a big one, yeah. Yeah. No, but that, there's no reason that can't, yeah, can't that. happen. And so what, what's going to be interesting is the division between what they can, what they can or will add back to Chromium, which will benefit all browser makers who use Chromium, and then what they use on Edge specifically, which will be their differentiators, the things that make Edge Edge, you know? Right. And so we don't know what that line is. So you asked about PDF, for example. Um, it's unlikely that will be added back to Chromium, but it's a, a, fair, it's a certainty they'll add it to Edge. Right. Uh, you know, the only thing negative I can see at all is this, is this notion that it's more of a monoculture, but there's still, <laughs> it does kind of box Apple in because Apple uh, is using its own platform Right. So and if they there have is to a make, standard, a de facto standard, they're not part of it. Mm -hmm. And they, uh, by the way, uh, Firefox, which I mentioned in the notes, is another, another issue because they're the other major browser maker that has a, a, a years-long effort to create their own rendering engine. They've done various you know, things to make it standards compliant, whatever. But I, I actually think both of those companies are going to have to eventually come around to the notion that they need to be on Chromium. And I know that's a big negative sticking point for a lot of people. But the rationale behind that is that for the same reason, it's it doesn't make a ton of sense for Microsoft. Mm -hmm. It's not really going to make a ton of sense yeah. for them either. It's yeah. just the wrong place to innovate. And it creates confusion and difficulty in work for developers. Right. Because if those yeah. are the three, 
now you have three things you have to worry about. It's like the old days, you know, this site best viewed on IE or whatever. Oh God, mm -hmm. um, that? yeah, yep. yeah. This is this is what this is what creates that, you know. And so, yeah. I have to think companies that make Chrome extensions are going to be thrilled. They don't have to. Yes. Although Chrome extensions well, and, kind of worked on Edge in the past, anyway, right? Mm -hmm. but, but for users, it's a big deal. How many extensions are on Edge today? Dozens no, at yeah, most. Not that yeah. Many. Yeah. How many are on uh, Chrome? Hundreds, a thousand? thousands. More? Yeah. I don't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's, Actually, it's that is it is probably a good thing as long as the standards bodies can, you know, kind of, you know, make sure that it's it maintains standards. I guess a web one single browser standard would probably be a good thing. Well, I mean, um, and they'll be more likely if there are flaws, which there will be. Every everything has flaws to get fixed, right? Because everybody's using it and everybody's working yep. on it and everybody's trying mm -hmm. to keep. The, the other thing is this will benefit Windows, which I think might ultimately be the real point. Leo mentioned PD PWAs. I think that's a big deal. Mary Jo mentioned this notion that Edge HTML and the web view that uh, developers use in apps today is going to continue. And that's true. But side by side with that, they're also going to offer this Chromium thing. So developers who, with less popular apps or apps that they don't want to update, can just leave it on Edge HTML that will continue working. It's fine. But for people who want to move forward to the future or developers who are making new apps, especially new web apps, they're going to want to uh, target Chromium now, not Edge HTML. And so those things will exist side by side. And I, I think, I bet we see a big exodus, frankly, uh, in any Well, now there's popular, momentum for sure. Yeah. I, I, I just don't see any reason for any developer to hold back and stick with Edge HTML as, once this is implemented, mm -hmm. you know, once it happens. Wow. Yeah, there was one more good thing that came of all this too that um, Microsoft is decoupling the browser from the operating system because of this and it's not going to become a store app they told me but the, it they are going to be updating the browser much more freq frequently than they do the operating system so instead of only getting edge updated to every two uh, let's say twice a year you'll yeah. get it updated constantly basically yeah what's the chromium schedule is it once a month or once I think it's once a month know. roughly is it you know, I think so. It's, yeah. If it's not, it's within two months. It's a, it's a very quick. They schedule. update a lot. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't know if they have a schedule for updating, but they do update a lot. Yeah, I don't think it's formal, but I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it was a month to six weeks. It's it's very quick, and these things kind of bing bing. You know, they happen. And I'm also I'm curious what you guys think about this concept of bringing it to Windows Seven and Eight One because Windows Seven in particular has about a year left in its uh, supported life cycle. Why would you do this now? I mean, I when Microsoft I announced it with Windows 10. Okay. <laughs> well, I was gonna say they should have done this all along. So what? what why? Yeah. Why do this now? Not why do this, yeah. but why do this now? Well, so the Windows 7 support ends January 2020, but there are a ton of enterprises who are going to have the extended support contracts for th at least right. three more years. So this is not just going to end in 2020. There's three more years that people will be using Windows 7 as a supported operating system. Yeah, and a lot, you know, actually, like we're still half. Only half of all users are still using Windows 10. Most are still using Windows 7 now. Wow! If you yeah. go to the Chromium uh, site, they have a calendar mm -hmm. stretching into the end of next year for when they're going to do releases, wow. all the way up through okay. 79. Mm -hmm. They their subjects change, obviously, but they this do they have uh, dates associated with those yeah. releases? Yeah, mm -hmm. so like what is the schedule? Uh, so we're currently on uh, 72. 73 comes out January 24th, then March 7th for 74, April 18th, May 30th, July 25th, so September 5th. Six September. weeks. Yeah. Yeah. And then that's a brand, what they call branch points, stable dates. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello. Uh, the internet police are coming. Are often uh, <laughs> shortly after or sometimes weeks after, but, they're, but they also have stable dates. They're, uh, December 10th, 2019, we'll get 79. That's mm. the estimated week of stable. So they this is a pretty well organized uh, mm. open source project because it's really good. Oh yeah. The other thing yeah. I find interesting, and I don't know what well, this means at all, but Chrome OS is based on Chromium as well. There's Chromium OS. Yeah. I don't know what that means for Chromebooks. Maybe that that rumor that Windows would run on Chromebooks. Maybe that was a little confused. Maybe it's that Chromebooks will run on Windows. Well, so there, you know, there are these companies that make 
a Chrome OS you can apply to. Yeah, they don't work very any well. PC. Yeah. But those are probably based on Chromium. OS, they are. Right? They're based on Chromium. Yeah. The other question here, and this is not something Microsoft would ever talk about now because they've never even announced it, but this Windows Lite OS that Mary Jo has been talking about recently, how does this impact that? Because that's essentially right. a Chromebook competitor. It's basically Chrome OS, but with Edge. But now that Edge is mm -hmm. Chromium, yeah. <laughs> you know, it gets it gets a little interesting. So that's you know, we, we can only speculate, but that's interesting right. right there. So so what I've heard about that is um it's a little bit complicated, but so light, this thing Brad found out about Windows Light is um we think it's Windows Core OS restricted. So almost like Windows 10 in S mode, except based on Windows Core OS, um, mm -hmm. with a very different look and feel um in terms of the UI. Definitely meant to be a Chromebook, Chrome OS competitor, as is, you know, the possibility of this kind of a browser. So what I heard from somebody is there are all these different possible pieces that Microsoft has now that could be Chrome OS competitors. You've got this Centaurus thing they're developing as a dual screen uh, device. You've got Light, and then you've got this new Edge based on Chromium. And maybe you use all three together. Maybe you use two two of those pieces together in some cases, maybe just one. So I think they're trying to kind of whip up all these different possibilities that could be Chromebook competitors, Chrome OS competitors in some mm -hmm. combination or standalone. And they, I don't think they know yet what things they're going to pull together. Well, and they have their experiences with Windows 10S and RT to kind of yeah. inform maybe what they do because they – you know, I don't think they could sustain a third, you know, yeah, uh, really yeah. bad thing. Did we did we talk about what was the impetus for this before? Did we, you know, in other words, why would Microsoft make this probably non Windows branded Chrome OS style platform now? Did we already talk about this? I can't um, we talked about it in terms of a rumor last week. You know, just the idea of it being yeah, because something as a Chrome Chromebook compete. Um, I, I wonder. I have to assume that. Microsoft has heard from its business customers from the enterprise that yeah. there are certain things they really like about Chrome OS. They don't really want to go to Google, and they have this mm -hmm. trusted relationship with Microsoft. They want to stay in the mm -hmm. Microsoft stack. Could Microsoft do something like this? You know, yeah, and like for first line I, I, workers, especially, right? Yeah, and I, I think yeah. the the RT and the Ten S stuff was kind of mm -hmm. their first very Windows centric attempt to meet that need, mm -hmm. and that finally now they're saying okay. We get it. You know, we can't, this mm -hmm. is not going to work. I, I always think back to that May event where they announced Surface Laptop, which was really an education event. And mm -hmm. Terry Myerson was walking around with a USB say, key saying, look, see how easy it is to deploy Windows to these machines? And I'm thinking <laughs> to myself, what, are you kidding me? I mm -hmm. mean, even if you had five or ten of them, you're going to go to a classroom with these things and plug USB <laughs> keys and everywhere. It's, really, it's ludicrous, right. right? So you almost <laughs> need something more sophisticated. No, you don't almost. You literally need something more sophisticated mm -hmm. that's simple and inexpensive and lightweight. Yeah. Uh, for those environments, right? And maybe they're finally heading in that direction. What what you also need is something not restricted to UWP and the store, right? So yeah. this new browser um, is not going to be a store app either, the new version of right. Edge. It's going to be yeah, a right. 132 app, right, <laughs> that you download right. um, from Microsoft's site, not go through the store. So I think I think that's... A lot of, in many cases, why 10s failed was because you were restricted to the store. What if you yep. had a restricted version of Windows that was a light version that wasn't, it wasn't restricted to store apps maybe, and it's restricted in some other way? Um, the other thing, it, well, it's also a chicken egg thing, right? Like what if yeah. it, Microsoft is trying to, or was trying to evolve web apps on the platform in a way that would make sense and make up for some of the mm -hmm. lacking that we see in the store. Now, we, this has not really happened. I have to think that part of what we're seeing today with Edge came out of that because developers and our people at Microsoft are like, look, we can't do this on our own platform or it's going to mm -hmm. take so long and be such a horrible thing to support. Plus, we only update the thing twice a year, mm -hmm. you know, that moving to Chromium is what made the most sense. And then that kind of opens up the floodgates mm -hmm. for web apps. And that maybe that does help them overcome the app gap yeah. that occurs in the True. store. Mm -hmm. Could be. I don't know. I'm I'm upbeat about the move, and yeah, I I know there there are a lot of people who have different objections: fear of Google, fear of monoculture. But you got to look at what was going on with Edge. They had like three percent market share. It was only going to go down. It wasn't going to go up as they stuck yeah, with their, yeah. you know, You're proprietary also, stuff. I mean, yeah. 
I also have to stop being such a hypocrite. I don't mean you, but I mean people who make these. Like, I hate Google. I'll never, I'll never trust Google. It's like, and you support Microsoft. <laughs> like, are you kidding me? Are you aware of the history of this company? <laughs> like, what? Like, what? Hmm. I mean, I look. You, you have to make this decision for yourself, obviously. And if you're going to go on moral grounds, God love you. But that's not necessarily a smart way to make technology decisions. Every business is a business, and they all have their own aims that have nothing to do with you. Hmm. Uh, yeah. You have to go on capabilities and so forth, but. Microsoft wasn't exactly a trustworthy company either. I love that they've turned it around, but mm -hmm. that kind of proves that uh, anyone could turn it around. So maybe Google could as well. But also there was this news this week, which we don't actually have in the show notes, that Microsoft is sending back telemetry data to itself from oh, Windows yeah. 10, mm -hmm. even when you turn yeah. it off. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, again, it, I'm not saying they're evil. They're not. But, I mean, they are a company. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's kind of silly just to, to worry about that kind of stuff. If you're, if you're worried about your privacy, that's I, that's legit. But I just yeah. hate Google. You know how much uh, cooperation with Google is there? I mean, you don't need to get Google's permission mm -hmm. to fork or to include Chromium in anything. No. But and especially, yeah. I think the acquisition of GitHub must have somewhat informed this, since GitHub has some expertise because of Electron mm -hmm. in working with mm -hmm. Chromium. Is Google so, is Google like? Are they partnering with Google? There, mm -hmm. no, no. <laughs> so it's not, here's the thing. <laughs> let, let me. I want. I. This is something I think I can describe accurately because I talked to these guys. I've seen misreports about this. I have my own hopes and dreams that Google and Microsoft are going to skip through the prairie and be wonderful <laughs> friends. But um, at a and at a uh, corporate <laughs> level, no, there is no partnership at all. Yeah. Um, the Microsoft's blog post about this happening didn't mention the word Google even once, which mm -hmm. is very interesting, <laughs> um, but also speaks to that. The Edge team's uh, later blog post, um, where they went into more of the technical details of what they were trying to do, did speak to Google a few times. Mm -hmm. But the Google they're talking about is a very small part of Google. It's the two or three guys who work in the standards group that are working on web you know, web apps mm -hmm. and so forth. Those guys love each other. They get to they get along yeah. great, but they don't represent Microsoft or Google. Right. No, and they're the, the guys that, who've been they're the guys who have been port working with Microsoft to get chromium to work on windows on arm right that's those people it's not google the big g uh, google. i don't actually think anyone from google was working on that actually but oh. uh, i think i think they were but i think they were the chromium google guys i don't think yeah, they were it's, the it's, google it's, guys there's no big partnership going on right and at the end mm -hmm. of the i think it's the, it's it has to be it's the, at the end if you look at the end of the uh, edge teams blog post they say we will be reaching out to Google in the coming days to see if we can't yeah. partner more on this stuff. And it's like, yeah. they, have, yeah, they haven't even spoken to them yet. Um, so, yeah, unfortunately, uh, at a corporate level, there's no, there's nothing there. And that no. makes me sad. I wish that would change. <laughs> I'm not surprised by that not being the case. Um, I, for once, Paul is more optimistic about something than me. <laughs> <laughs> new, listen, Edge is going open source, baby. Everything can change. No, I don't know. <laughs> it's, I, I have hopes. I mean, I'm trying channel. to be realistic about it. It's changed his whole perspective. <laughs> yeah, I'm just, really a, I'm just all, I'm all upside now. He's That's a new, new guy. Thing. Wow, I should have done this years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, take Twit open source, Leo. It's going to be great. Mm. Uh, we use a lot of open source stuff. Actually, our whole back end mm. is open source. Your sure. uh, podcast is produced with open source software, except for Premiere, Adobe Premiere. But I just like, think there is an, it's inevitable. I, I, you know, it is. I, you know, it's so funny yeah. that you're saying this because I've been saying this for years. Yeah, but now that I'm saying it, it makes sense. Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, no, you're right. No, you're right. You're absolutely right. Oh, it's but, like there's um, a lot of people, maybe this is a really radical point of view, who think the notion of proprietary software is almost over, that it's a bad idea. Well, that's and by the heretical. way, to be clear, this doesn't, we're not talking about software you pay for versus software you don't pay for or anything like that. I mean, um, one of the things that kind of no, came up out of this no, was. It's, it's uh, free, not as in beer. Free yeah. as in libre. Free as in. Uh, you, you have to be pragmatic, you know. and Standards. And, yeah. 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 I, uh, so in the crazy aftermath of this announcement, somebody asked me, okay, given the fact that anything could happen now, you know, what's your pie in the sky what could happen? Like, what? It's trying to dream. Like, what could you predict? And the only thing I could come up with is, which probably can't happen for a million reasons. I get it. Why can't? Why not just open source Windows? It's open source Windows. 
It doesn't eliminate the enterprise licensing stuff where they make all their money. That, that's all based on support anyway. Um, you know, if you look at what they did, it's kind of goofy because these are relatively small things. But with WinPF, WinPF, <laughs> no, w, mm -mm. WPF, yeah, WinPF, we, uh, uh, WPF, WinForms, WinUI, last week going open source, uh, apply this model to Windows. It's not about making Windows available on the Mac or, you know, whatever that kind of stuff is. But uh, more along the lines of getting a different kind of feedback about how Windows should change at a more technical level. You know, they have the insider program for enthusiasts, but this is a completely different way of, well, how do we develop this thing going forward? It's mm. it's never going to happen, I know, but it's a possibility. Alex Lindsay's been calling for open sourcing uh, Mac OS for years, too. Mm. The truth is, if you think about it, you don't open source it if you're if it's your crown jewel, but uh, but it's clear we're moving to a cloud based world where OS I, either one of these things is those doesn't matter. Crown jewel. In fact, right. what's the real OS? It's the browser, mm -hmm. right? It is in a way. Right. Yep. That's actually the embarrassment for Microsoft with Edge. You know that the the web browser is for virtually everyone the most popular application, the one they use the most often. Mm -hmm. And Microsoft somehow found a way to beat that power of the default. They put Edge in Windows and no one uses it, <laughs> despite the fact that it's the default. Yeah. I mean, you have to be really bad for that to not work out yeah. for you. You know, it's, it's I kind mean, of interesting. I mean, the, the reason I got took XS off, I, I got out of XS mode on my yeah. Go, was because I you couldn't Chrome. use Chrome. Yeah. <laughs> It was the, that was the reason. You know, maybe this the is only reason. <laughs> a hail mary to save Windows 10s. Kind well, of, geez. right? I, listen, I mean, I no, said this. like it could be the hail mary to save it if it re-emerges as Windows Lite, maybe. Yeah, yeah. As a, right? as a Microsoft has been looking for a Windows for the future that makes sense for a long time. You know, yeah. They've they've understood that this kind of architectural nightmare they've created is you know a one Jenga piece away from collapsing on itself. And they've been trying to fix it, you know, and it's hard to get from here to there. But uh, RT and 10s have been two of the attempts. Like, we'll see if this Windows Lean thing is an attempt. But um, basing it on something that's standards and web, you know, would make more sense. Yeah. What was my thing about 10s? Remember, I used to, I'd say, look, allow a little switch. Turn off S mode yeah. for a minute. Let me install Chrome and I'll turn it back on. That would, this is kind of like that, that in a way, right? Yeah, that would work for like 90% of, of the normal people who use Windows. Yeah, that's yeah. that one change would have made all the difference. And actually, yeah, you're right, that's interesting. The way I use Go, right, is I still am only using all store apps except for Chrome. Hmm. That's the only That's the only one I'm not using. You still as use a store. Could, Go? That thing is I could so do it. I, I, mm -hmm. I could actually make that work. I mean, the the... Um, if I had Chrome, of course, I could install the web apps to the taskbar, which I like. Yeah. I use the store version of OneNote, the store version of Adobe Photoshop Elements. I could use the store version of uh, Twitter, obviously. Mm. It's possible. Yeah. You know, I think we've actually stumbled on something interesting here through mm -hmm. the back door. And, and of course, Microsoft's never going to make Windows open source because it's got too much proprietary code <laughs> it's, in it. This is such an awesome idea. You know, you're right. Yeah. No, <laughs> but they don't need to because when they said this is the last version of Windows, I think it's true. Mm -hmm. I think, honestly, moving to Chromium is really the step towards mm -hmm. post Windows. Yeah, post Windows. Mm -hmm. yeah. Where the, I mean, Chrome OS is an operating system based on Chromium. Mm -hmm. You could have a Linux kernel or you could have a Windows kernel. That doesn't really matter. If everything's in the cloud and your user interface is actually dictated by your browser. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the amount of time that we've been running on an NT-based version of Windows is astonishing. It is. You know? <laughs> um, yep. it, was, it first released in 93, uh, replaced Windows proper in 2001. It's that 17 years later. You know, the original version of DOS Windows was uh, first released in 85, didn't become popular in 90. Nothing lasted 11 years. Uh, no, yes, uh, let's say, yeah, 10, mm -hmm. 10 years. We're almost double the time on NT now. And like I said, they've made attempts, like they see it, they understand, you know. Uh, but of course, with Windows not being the center of the company anymore, mm -hmm. uh, you know, 
where do you go with this thing? Well, and as a developer or as, uh, you know, anybody making apps, now you really have to start thinking. And this is so much better. And this is why you and I, I think, Paul, we're excited about progressive mm -hmm. web apps. You yeah. don't develop for an uh, operating system anymore. You develop for right. a, uh, right. pl a platform, a browser platform. A true cross. This is like mm -hmm. the promise of Java that actually <laughs> happened. No, right, like, right once. And what Microsoft does by making Edge Chromium is they make sure that it will have a true native experience on Windows machines. Right. Right. Yep. See, the, the, the PWA thing is just like any other like web standard that you have to implement in a browser. You, you, you can see it out there. You know you have to do this thing, but then you have to do the work to make it look and work exactly like it does somewhere yep. else. Or just take the somewhere else and put it in your system. It just works the mm. same. I mean, it really does make and sense. Well, there's the other the other thing we haven't talked about is in this Windows light rumored thing, there's talk about Windows Core OS, the way the way that Windows Core OS will run Win32 apps is virtually, either in a container, a VM, or even remotely from a server somewhere. Like that's that's part of the rumor of what this thing is. So if that happens, you've got PWAs on one hand, then you've got your any existing business apps that are Win32 that you're like, okay, what do I do with those? What if you could run those in a container or in a VM? I think sense. this is the only way you can handle this legacy pass. You contain it, mm -hmm. literally. Yep. Uh, mm -hmm. Let people still run it when they need to, you know, and and try to push them toward new stuff where, wherever else is possible. You know, it's, mm -hmm. um, I guess it's a little bit like Windows 10 on ARM. You know, it does emulation. It's only x86. Being able mm -hmm. to run something a little slowly is better than not being able to run it. So that system... Yep. In many ways, is better than 10s. Although I realize mm -hmm. 10s also runs it, but whatever. Um, it, it's it, it it's you you have to give people a, a way to move forward while retaining what's important to them, and I think yeah. that's where 10s has failed. It was just a, mm -hmm. a, the door just slammed shut. Yeah. I am actually very excited. Now that Me too. We kind of framed it this way. Yep. Uh, I think we're seeing a peek into the future. Yeah. And yeah. It is the future, too, because the first developer um, previews of this aren't until sometime next year. Hmm. So right. it's not going to be out anytime soon. Do you imagine, as I do, as we're doing the show, thinking about Chris Capicella running along listening? <laughs> and, then, and then when we suddenly get around to this, which obviously yep. this would be something they would be talking about in the executive meeting. Sure. He goes, yes. <laughs> I just, well, I imagine they got it. that. They I figured it out. They figured it out. <laughs> I imagine it's a combination of, no, you idiots, that's not right. it. And some of that. Yes, they yeah. got it. You know, basically, sure we're not. for us, Chris Capicella is God looking over <laughs> us, yes. rooting us on, cheering us on, sad when we <laughs> sin, happy, mm -hmm. happy when we choose the You've path You've just described a parent where like the little kids running around <laughs> in a soccer field. We're just we bumping are. into each other. But every once in a while, one of us scores a goal, and he can be proud of that. Yes. Uh, we finally figured it out. Their evil <laughs> strategy. But it's very yeah. clear now. I mean, this is what uh, Nadella's been doing from day one. This is the – it's not like yeah. it's hidden. And it's – I mean, right. it's – you know, it doesn't – it took us – it took me a little while to understand it, but it's not no, that. But that's the that's the beautiful way to view that uh, what's happening. It, this finally is – because we – we keep talking about this new culture at Microsoft, thanks to Satya Nadella. You can see all the parts of Microsoft, you know, starting with the uh, office for the iPad, literally when we first walked through the door. And this is it being applied to the stuff I care about, and I think Mary Jo cares mm -hmm. about the most, you know, mm -hmm. Windows. And it's hard not to wonder now, good, it's finally happening. So what's next? Yeah. You know? Right. Where else I are know. they going to do this? Yeah. The possibilities are intoxicating <laughs> frankly i mean it's kind of <laughs> it's interesting no i mean we joked earlier about windows and open source but remember what i forget what the context was but mark rusinovich actually said in a keynote somewhere like we could open source windows it, that was like a few years ago and everybody's like oh he's just speaking hypothetically or he's just saying that to mm. be controversial but now if he said that people would be like yeah you could you actually could <laughs> i i so windows is humongous right Right. I can only imagine the embarrassment of some of the source code in there that's 20 something years old. True. That's and true. I assume they'd have to go through like comb through it clean and it just up. clean it yeah. up, you know. Which true. by the way wouldn't be such a horrible thing for Windows, you know. Right. 
I mean, the next thing we think they're going to open source are some of the legacy apps in Windows, right? Like, so right. we think Paint and maybe Notepad okay. and other things like that are going to get open sourced. I've heard that explicitly, yeah. Yeah. Because um, someone someone had said something like, oh, I heard uh, or Microsoft said maybe they were thinking about putting this stuff in the store. And I was like, yeah, maybe. I, I, that sounds vaguely familiar. But I, yeah. I literally just heard they were going to open source that stuff. Oh, yeah. It was you who said that. I'm like, somebody said that. Who said that? Yeah. Yeah. I just, yeah. Brad made a joke about it the other day and I said, oh, actually, that is happening, didn't I? I guess I never, I guess yeah. I never mentioned it. I just heard about it, but um, yeah, that's what I, that's what I've heard. I mean, that, that wouldn't be shocking, right? I mean, it would be like, no. yeah, that makes sense. Where The way they're going, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. Wow, I think we've decoded the, uh, <laughs> the mystery. <laughs> <laughs> the mystery of Microsoft. Well, you know what? I, seriously, I, this has been a tough year for people like us, right? Windows <laughs> has not had a great year. Between the two feature updates and Terry and all, they're not on the senior leadership team anymore and blah, 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 whatever. It, you know, had this not happened, this would have been possibly the most negative year ever, but certainly since some of the Longhorn darkness, right? Uh, actually, some of the Stephen Sanofsky stuff. You know what? Actually, this year didn't really rate, did it? Anyway, <laughs> the point is, <laughs> there have been worse. <laughs> been worse. <laughs> We've had some bad years. We've had some ups and downs. But uh, this was not a great year. And I, I feel like this thing coming right at the end of the year like it did mm. kind of saved it yeah. a little bit, you know? Boy, I really it, wonder nice how to, hard this was to push through. Like, was did everybody just say, "Oh, of course"? Or I'm dying to hear what the it edge was. team must like have I, gone kipping, kicking, and screaming. Obviously, right? well, I think it had to have come from. I think it was the PW. I think that through some it's combination of guys. things, they were like, "Guys, yeah. we can't do this yeah. the way we're doing it. Yeah. It's just not mm. going to work." It may so just I don't, be the, the writings on the wall. You look at the metrics; it's going down. Yeah. It's never. They're yeah. never getting any market share. Yeah. Okay. My guess is it was the office team who kind of. Now that Office and Windows are working much closer together and they're under Rajesh Jha, who ran the Office team, I think they probably just said, look, guys, this isn't working out. You know, we we have some uh, UWP versions of some of the Office apps and not really all that right. well received. We need we need a different strategy here. Like, let's start talking about other things we could do, right? I really not wonder. Mention, Apple has never been a good a, a team player. And the right <laughs> thing for them to do would be to do the same thing. But they're not going to do that, are they? <laughs> No. no. You know, uh, Safari was probably the last thing Apple did where they still were talking about open source or whatever. Um, remember in the early days of Mac OS X, they used to really talk up yeah, that stuff. Yeah. And they were making contributions Darwin back and, to yeah. Darwin and blah, blah, blah. Um, that ended silently. I don't remember <laughs> when exactly. But, um, yeah, I, 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 Apple's not a good partner in any way. Apple mm -hmm. actively seeks to eliminate every partner they have. Yeah. That's their strategy. Yeah. But I, I, you can't – I don't think you can swim against this tide. Boy, I, think, I think it's edge, just a edge matter of time. On Mac is going to be a, a reasonable choice. You'll have a choice between Chrome and Edge. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons people use Safari is because Chrome is notoriously re a resource hog, especially battery on your mm -hmm. laptop. If mm -hmm. uh, this is something, just a little tip to the uh, Edge team: if yeah. you if you can make a lightweight, fast browser that yeah. doesn't kill battery life, that will be the choice. So, yeah. speaking of battery life, that's actually something Chrome has improved. I can't say to the Mac, but on Windows it has, and. With every version of Windows 10 that's come out, Microsoft has put a little video and said, look, look how much better battery life this thing gets than uh, Chrome does. But over time, yeah. that thing, I don't, these numbers aren't exact, but it went from 57% better battery life to 35%. Oh, Last time it did, it was 14%. Oh, well, there you go. So when, when this version came out, I said, hey, did anyone notice that Edge never came out with a little video showing how much better the battery life was? <laughs> I, think yeah. that, I, think it, I think it flipped. Oh, that's. Mm -hmm. I'll have to look on the on the on the Mac side. I don't know. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. On, on well, Mac, the best thing is we'll no longer get these pop ups when you use Chrome on Edge saying Edge is better, and when you go to a <laughs> Google site in Edge, Chrome is better. Or well, maybe that won't well, stop. Let's Listen, hope. We want to bring, the, we wanna bring the platforms align, Leo. You know. <laughs> um, I, I will say this: uh, Microsoft Office is well regarded on the Mac for some reason. It is. Um, it's the. It's I don't the, know why. It's. I don't know why. Can, I mean, Apple has um, its own office that's much more Macish. I yes, it's just not used <laughs> in any offices, which is part of the problem. Mm. Yeah, but the uh, the one thing Microsoft has been pushing lately with Mac Office is how Mac like it is. You know, they're kind of a we're yeah. a good Mac citizen, yeah. blah blah blah. Yeah. Whatever. So they could throw that in there with Office and and make it part of that effort and. Mm -hmm. There might be some oh, might be some benefit to that. You know? Well, they have dark mode now in uh, in Microsoft yes, Office. Yes, they do. Mojave. Yes, they do. <laughs>
So there you go. The writing's on the wall. But you can't read it because it's so dark. But it's 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 all going edge. That's what this means. <laughs> We're all going edge. We finally we finally revealed our secret plan. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, the reason the reason they said they brought edge to the Mac, if you're if you're wondering what they said, is because mm -hmm. we know many people who develop software use Mac, and if oh, you're yeah. a developer, we want to just make it easy for you to try something that in in edge against edge. So if it's on the Mac, we hope you will just try it. It's a really good point. Developers do seem to like Macintosh. They do. Unless they're doing, you know, .NET. Right. Right. Although .NET Core, it's yeah. on the Mac. I know, .NET Core, Mac. Yeah. Yep. Oh, huh, that's interesting. Another open source thing. And by the way, you know, .NET Core is, it yep. doesn't, we don't talk about it a lot. And, and uh, well, because it's kind of a dense developer topic. But yep. remember that .NET as originally envisioned was the new app platform, essentially, the new platform that ran on top of Windows. It was in some ways one attempt at getting to the future of Windows. A lot mm -hmm. of the things we've seen since culminating with uh, the store apps like w UWP are essentially .NET style or .NET based APIs and SDKs and so forth. Um, taking that thing, which was very Windows centric and making it open source, it runs on Linux yeah. and the Mac as well as uh, Windows is very, very interesting. And, um, you know, not all of that stuff is you know, cross-platform, obviously the WPF when UI stuff is going to be Could Windows only, make, but what, okay, here's a crazy thought. Well, I'd love to see what's really lacking on uh, Chrome OS is a developer platform. Be really yeah. interesting to see if they could move Visual Studio Code to an Electron. It's not an Electron. It is an Electron app. Actually, it, is it is an, an Electron, electron app. app. Oh, yep. yep. Oh, that would be a breakthrough. And then, that's how you um, beat Mac at Apple at this game. I mean, the reason developers use Apple is because it's a kind of a, a Unix command line, I think. That's why I use it. Uh, yes. Uh, Windows and, also has one. Yeah, Linux, no, but. that Linux subsystem <laughs> from Windows is not the same. Yeah, I, uh, Nor is, frankly, Linux on Chrome OS, which people will, you know, also mm. you say. I can but we have that. open SSH, Leo. Come on, what do you need? Well, I do. Frankly, I, I SSH into my... Uh, my Linux server when I want to do that. But a better way would be a native app. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, hmm. I, you know, I, Donna Core, I don't know. I mean, I don't know hmm. what comes out of that. It's interesting. It's just, oh, it's interesting. They should just I, give up on .NET. <laughs> <laughs> That's over. Forget it, guys. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Give up on no. UWP. Give up on .NET. It's uh, the world's uh, changed. We're now all PWA. <laughs> Well, .NET Core, like again, uh, being uh, cross-platform and .NET, uh, what do you call it, uh, ASP.NET Core, um, being available on other platforms is important because you could use those as the basis for web services and web apps and so forth. Yep. Interesting. Um, Everything's different. Let's take a little tiny, but tiny team out. Time, team, time, time, team it out. No, but let's stop, <laughs> and I will do an ad. <laughs> And you will continue. How about that? Sounds good. Right. Enjoy. Uh, smoke them if you got them, Mary Jo. Our, uh, right. our <laughs> <laughs> Woo. <laughs> Woo. Uh, it is time to talk about our fine sponsor, which I think this is a company that is probably very excited about this, which is LastPass. LastPass makes, of course, a plugin for Edge as well as a Chrome plugin and a Safari plugin. And an app for Windows, and an app for Mac, and an app for iOS and Android. So it's everywhere. I even use LastPass uh, in, on Linux. It's the password vault. That's actually the main reason I use... Well, there's several reasons. I'll tell you why I use LastPass, then I'll tell you why you need to use LastPass. Uh, I use LastPass because uh, I don't like passwords. Never have. I don't like remembering passwords. And uh, the days are long gone when I used monkey123 as my password. I did. I did use monkey123 as my password for many, <laughs> many years, as I'm sure many of you have similar stories. Because you don't, who can remember all these, pa who can remember them? Fortunately, about 10 years ago, I discovered LastPass as a secure, encrypted, and by the way, only decrypted on your device so the LastPass folks can't see your passwords. Encrypted password vault that generates long, strong, random passwords 
The password options are great in their password generator. It's built into LastPass. It's everywhere. You can choose alphabetic. You can choose numeric. You can choose punctuations. They even have uh, easy to read, uh, avoid ambiguous characters. I think they now call it easy to uh, speak or easy to read. They have new phrases. But it's the same idea where you don't have ones and L's because that makes it confusing, right? Or O's and zeros. You can specify the length. And I always choose, by the way, you know, I always choose... I'm giving this away. Odd lengths, weird lengths, like 17 or 22, not 12 or 24, any of the obvious lengths. Pick a weird length, make it just a little bit harder. And then the good news is you don't have to remember that. The little thing pops up and says, you want me to remember that for you? LastPass says, yeah, I'll remember that. And now not only does it remember it on the device I made that password, it remembers it everywhere. So I, I, I don't know any of my passwords, and I don't need to, and that's awesome. I just know, need to know the one password to unlock LastPass. Actually, if your business uses Active Directory, you can actually even forget that password. Use your Active Directory credentials, log into everything. That's sweet. So LastPass for me, and then there's lots of additional features. There's a security check. You can find <laughs> sites that you used Monkey123 on and, and change that easily. There's a one button, change this password. Uh, Find passwords you've reused. We all do it. Uh, after the Marriott break-in, maybe we're thinking twice about that. Uh, it'll find all of those. The securities check will say, well, you got these 38 sites with the same password. You want to change them? And it'll do it. Boom, 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 boom. It's great. It's just awesome. And then you have all that. I trust LastPass so much, I don't just put passwords in there. This, to me, is my, my trusted vault for everything. My passport images when I travel. My driver's license, social security numbers, anything I need to keep track of. It's exactly what you need. It's the first app I install. When I get a new phone or a new computer, I sit down, I install LastPass because that facilitates the rest of it. Everything else, boom, 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 it just autofills. And by the way, iOS 12 now, autofill finally for LastPass. Uh, Apple didn't like that for a long time. Now it does it. Uh, of course, Android has done it for some time. That's nice, too, because you open an app. Every time I'd like, let's say I'm, I'm going to put Instagram on my on my phone, which I don't. But if I were, I would say, okay, pat, there's a button on iOS 12, password, fills it in, boom, done. It uses Face ID or Touch ID, so it's very easy to unlock the vault, and yet still it's secure. There's also lots of additional features inside LastPass, and Steve Gibson's really good at this. He explained this all when he interviewed the founder of LastPass, looked at the source code, things like PBKDF. The derivative function, you can say, I want that to be 50,000, which means brute force, virtually impossible. Rainbow tables doesn't work. If you're into, if that's the kind of stuff that rings your chimes, you should listen to Security Now. And actually, there's a whole episode on LastPass and where he talks about all of this. Now, that's why I use LastPass. But here's why we use it here at work and why your business ought to use it. LastPass Enterprise. Because your employees are doing all sorts of terrible, no good, very bad things with passwords. They're putting them on Post-it notes on the screen. Worse than that, they're sharing it not only with other employees but with people at home. <laughs> and, and right, you have to give your employees the keys to the kingdom. It's like you say, yeah, here's, the, here's our bank account. Here's our server. Here's... <laughs> Here's our databases. Sure, take it. It's all yours. When you have LastPass Enterprise, not only do they not get the password, they can't share the password. And if they leave, you can revoke access. You actually have over 100 policies in LastPass Enterprise. Things like setting the master password requirement, requiring two-factor, we do that. So every employee has to use two-factor, like it or not. Uh, by the way, the LastPass multi-factor authentication app is great because just like it's like the Microsoft one, but which you can use, by the way. But uh, but it's nice because it pops up an approved deny. It doesn't it doesn't make you type in a six digit code. I really like it. What else can I tell you? Data, it, as I said, is never decrypted except at the device level, so no one else has access to it. That's I know people are really concerned. This is uh, security is number one, job one at LastPass. Uh, we put every business piece of information in there. Oh, the shared folders are nice. So everybody in the business department can have a shared folder where they have access to all the uh, resources and assets they need access to. But only the people in the business department get it. You know, our engineering team has a separate folder like that. We we use that at home. Lisa and I have a family folder. So when I set up, you know, the, the you know when when we set up the electric bill, she gets the login and I get it. It's all automatic. It's all shared. 
16 million people use LastPass. It's the number one most preferred password manager. It is mine, has been for 10 years. It's what we use at work. It's even a benefit of employee at Twit. Every employee gets LastPass personal as well because we want them to secure their entire life. And uh, they seem to like that. LastPass premium for personal use. LastPass families for the family. LastPass teams for 50 or fewer people in the LastPass enterprise, which we use here. Take control of your business passwords. Reduce the threat of breach. Learn more at lastpass.com slash twit. Lastpass.com slash twit. Make this be, uh, you know, this this will be the last year you use monkey123 as a password. <laughs> You're laughing, but I really did for That's years. That's the password I use in my luggage. It's, I think, the most, <laughs> it's the most used. It's one, a monkey. For some reason, see, I thought, oh, I'm being clever. No one will use monkey. It it always shows up at the very top of the list. I don't know why. <laughs> I can't even imagine why that's... Why monkey? Of all yeah, things, that's right? That's strange. But there's something about monkeys we all... Uh, I don't know. Anyway, it's obviously this the first one of the first things bad guys try. <laughs> all right, on we go with the show. I, I, I'm glad you spent some time with the... Uh, the edge thing, because actually, I think that that turns out to be strategically a very yeah. interesting insight. To what I'm Microsoft actually, to. I'm glad that both of you guys are on board with this. Yeah. I think this is yeah. the smartest thing they've done in a long time. Yeah. Same. Yeah. Yep. Uh, 19 H1, the new version of Windows 10. Something the chat room said, because I said Microsoft said they'll not. This is the last version of Windows. They said no, they didn't really say that. Did they? Did say that though, right? Yeah, they did. Oh yeah. I'm not making yeah. that yep. up. No, that's they didn't mean it like Windows. <laughs> we're releasing Windows 10 in July, and this is the end. They they no, they, they update. I mean, we're going to keep. Yeah, yeah, we're updating. But it. they're not charging people for it. You get the updates yeah. automatically as soon as you get to 10. You're done. Leo, yeah. to be clear, there is a payment, and it's it has something to do with your soul. But there, there's, <laughs> you're right. There are things blood. in Windows. That, yeah. Trust me, you pay for it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what are we seeing? I guess a new version uh, of 19H1 is is their code name for the next version, right? What it was is. that? Redstone five. It was supposed to be Redstone six. Six, but now it's 19H1. Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, so this week on Monday, which is unusual for uh, a day to drop an insider build, Microsoft released the latest 19H1 test build to fastering. It's one eight two nine eight. And the most important thing... You know you why we're letting Mary this. Jo do this. <laughs> You're going to find it's, out. Guys, it's full of notepad features. I'm not even making this up. <laughs> Paul says, for some reason, in his show notes. I know. And I'm like, wait, for some reason? This is the Mary Jo update. That Everyone's joking. You should call this Mary Jo Foley update. I'm like, well, if you need, if you need someone to use as your spokesmodel... I'm here. Now, I read uh, Peter Bright's article about, what, uh, maybe it was yours. I read the article about all the new features, and some of them are kind of like mm -hmm. line yeah. endings. I mean, come on, line really? Ending. Well, I mean, what they're trying to do is make Notepad more appealing to developers because oh. a lot of developers use Notepad. Really? I mean, not just people like me, but, yeah. Why, yeah. Why wouldn't you use Visual Studio? I know. Like or code completion and... Visual Studio Lint. Code, Visual Studio. Yeah, code. Yeah. Is, I actually really like code. <laughs> yeah. But some people do use Notepad and uh, for developer. I use it to write, as everyone knows. So a lot of these features don't matter a whole lot to me, but they matter more to developers. So Feedback Hub integrations built into Notepad now. So if you have something you want to tell Microsoft about Notepad, it's really easy to go straight to Feedback Hub from inside the app and give them your feedback. Um, this is an interesting one. Notepad now shows an asterisk in the title bar of any document that hasn't been saved. Can I, I you know that's like so basic, so fundamental. I know. But they didn't have it. <laughs> <laughs> no, guys, yep. come on. Both those things you just described, are they yes. gonna put those in every other application that comes with Windows? Or are they are just in Notepad for some reason? I also, how about Notepad. just auto saving? <laughs> Could we, I know, can well, we have an auto you know, save option? I know. So they've talked about autosave. I've seen people say what the one thing I want in Notepad is autosave, and so far it's not there still. Um, so I don't know if they're going to add that. I think I, I, Notepad's I, the last refuge from autosave. It kind of is. The, it's for those who want to come out from under the foot of autosave. <laughs> yes. <laughs> free at okay. last. Free at last. <laughs> Hasn't been yeah, updated since Windows Vista. Oh, well, actually, that's uh, not true. No, there's <laughs> other things about um, open and saving p files with a path longer than 260 characters, UTF-8 encoding. I don't know what those things are, but I'm sure some people do and they care a lot. 
<laughs> People who um, have titles for their <laughs> files that are very long, like this run on sentence, would like to see that because then they can have their right. files be I really, very really short long names. No, no, uh, we give a little credit to what Leo just did, by the way, with that giant run on sentence, um, <laughs> which is basically like a like a Unix More command line thing yeah, that would it was, be impossible. It was a one liner. Was, yeah. Yeah. That's good. What? The obfuscated code <laughs> award winner. For, C. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It does beg the question, like if somebody really cares about real features, why would they use Notepad? They'd use exactly. Notepad++ or something. I mean, there's right. so many good editors, you know. Yep. Steve Gibson no, still the, uses Brief. Remember Brief? No. No. <laughs> so, I, I, was a I DOS a lot editor, of stuff, but I've never heard DOS of that. Editor. A DOS editor. Uh, it was a DOS editor. He uses wow. it in the DOS emulation what? mode. <laughs> hey. <laughs> That's why I write everything in the Borland uh, yeah. Pascal yeah. editor. I just oh, like I it. I love that. Oh, I love it. Yeah. Those were the days. <laughs> no, but, you know, I, I have a mixed feeling about whenever I see notepad, notepad, new notepad features, I'm like, guys, do not wreck notepad. You don't need to do a lot no, to Notepad. It alone. Yeah, it's good the way it is. <laughs> I just want to know why they're doing anything to it. I mean, at, at the exclusion of everything else in Windows, you know, it's, it's goofy to me okay. that they've at like there's a little menu item, like she said, where you can go, get, you know, provide some feedback for Notepad. And it, look, it yeah. goes right to that place in the, the feedback hub where the Notepad stuff is because people <laughs> using Notepad are too dumb to find it, I guess. <laughs> but hey, hey, hey. No, sorry, sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't mean it like that. But. <laughs> what I really meant was, why in Notepad? Like, why would yeah. everything do that? Is that menu in Paint? Is it in Word? The Pad? Notepad is it in? breed is a different animal. It kind of is. Honestly, is. Mary Jo's the only person I ever heard of who uses Notepad. No, you're there. Every time, every time I say <laughs> something about Notepad, it's like people come out of the woodwork to give the high five, the secret handshake about okay, Notepad. First of all, know, like, I was not in the woodwork when I alerted you to this. You were not. <laughs> it's like no, a Paul, Paul put knife. a tweet out and he's like, Mary Jo, there's so many notepad features in today's build. And I was like, what? I know. Yeah. Please highlight. There were a couple other things. In all caps, by the way. There were a couple other things. They're improving the built-in touch keyboard. Um, what else is there? Narrator fixes. You can barely, you can barely spit out the non-notepad updates. You're like, I don't care what it is. Yeah. I was like, yeah, there's some notepad, lots of notepad stuff. And then they did a couple other tweaks with some fluenty, blah, 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 whatever. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> some other Anyway, nonsense. yeah, there's some there's some other features in there. there. Because they didn't do a build last week because they had something happen. I forget exactly what they said. Um, something that prevented them from releasing a build. So this build has a, a lot more fixes and updates. Probably than a notepad-related screw-up of some kind. Not even a notepad-related screw-up, but yeah. <laughs> anyway, hmm. they continue on the path for 19H1, and the and the first bug bash Notepad. for this thing is in January. So we're getting like it's like starting to become it's, like the, the final way, features. This is closer than you're even kind of hinting at because for much of December they're not going to do anything. Oh, you're right. Because <laughs> like right, of Christmas, it's not like they're going to be bizarre, building because 1809 the just barely came out. I know. Well, Listen, that was. They're going to get one fluke. of these. They got to get one done on time, Leo. They're going to do it, however, it, whatever it takes. So yeah. this will be uh, March? Around March, April. March, RTM. Do we and really then do we uh, talk April dates roller. anymore at Microsoft? Do we really. <laughs> the first half is any time, sensitive to any this? time before July. It will be before the summer solstice. That's all we'll promise. <laughs> it doesn't even have to be before the summer solstice. It doesn't. <laughs> That's true. It could be That's June true. 28th. Good. It could be, it could be, you know, whatever. When it's ready. When it's ready. That's right. the point. When it's done. Yep. I'm just basking in the glow of... Of the notepad. <laughs> updated notepad. It's so beautiful. <laughs> Such a thing. Nice. Oh, boy. <laughs> uh, Microsoft 365 Insider Program. You can now get the latest builds of 365. <laughs> is that Office? Yeah, so, yeah, so okay. Microsoft 365 is Windows 10 Enterprise plus Office oh. 365 Enterprise plus Intune, some of the Intune features, oh, all okay. bundled together, right? So it was only a matter of time before you saw them do something that they call Microsoft 365 Insiders. And what this is really is the successor to what they currently call Windows uh, Insider for Business. So if you're a business customer and you 
are somebody who typically rolls out off new office builds and Windows builds and you want to see how they work together, you would be a good candidate to be in the Microsoft 365 Insider program. It's, it's enterprise though, right? It's enterprise only. Enterprise. Yeah. Yep. Enterprise. Um, Donna Sarkar and her team is going to work with the Office Insider team to run this. So if you're in, if you're somebody who's right now in Windows Insider for business, you probably want to look at getting into this. There's already a sign up page. You can get in there. I don't know what they're testing right now. Um, if they've actually started testing, but it's there. Walking Cat was haven't, the one who found this Haven't page. they really, though, always done this for IT departments and enterprise? I mean, isn't kind of this a, a, a informally always been the case or no? You know, they've always encouraged um, IT departments to test things before yeah. they came out. You know, like, okay, set up a pilot ring. Right. Make sure you're testing this before it hits all your exactly. desktops. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But this is more of a formal way to look at Makes that. Makes it easier to do it, I guess. It does. Yeah. It does. Okay. Yep. Very nice. But this next thing. What? 365 <laughs> what? Consumer? <laughs> What's that? That makes sense. But What's this that? next thing. What's that all about? <laughs> yeah, good question. So I thought they weren't going to do this, right? Like I thought Microsoft 365 was just a business thing. You know, they, they have a government version, a first line worker version, education version of Microsoft 365. But there's something called Microsoft 365 Consumer. I found it by accident when I was trolling around the Microsoft job site, as one does. And <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> um, all of a sudden, I'm like, wait, what is this thing? And then I looked it up. I'm like, they're advertising multiple jobs for somebody to work on the Microsoft 365 Consumer team. So okay, so what is this thing? Good question. Like, what's in the bundle like this for consumers? A, sub a subscription bundle. Um there were hints in the job post that Skype would be part of it, possibly Cortana, Bing, um, maybe the MSN apps and services. And if you want to make it parallel to what Microsoft 365 looks like, you would include Windows in there too, and Office 365, of course. Um, Microsoft says they have nothing more to share about this right now, but mm -hmm. I... Um, I think it's going to be interesting to see what this is and what gets bundled. I mean, maybe it's something that is tied to Surface and you can only get this bundle if you buy Surface um, or somehow a leasing program is involved. You know, like it's, hey, you can get the subscription bundle and Surface as a leasing deal. There, there were just like a lot of hints around their their new group that Yusuf Mehdi runs, which is modern uh modern life and devices. So that's Microsoft's plan to try to get consumers back yeah. and kind of, you know, get them to believe in the company again. And the kind of people they're targeting with this, are, they call professional consumers. So that's why there's no the gaming in this bundle. What's a professional consumer? So a professional consumer is, is that somebody- Martha Stewart? What is that? Someone like, who has like a like, Prime account? <laughs> it's like us, people who want to use technology to be more productive, um, it's not gamers. It's not people who don't know about technology. It's kind of like people who are willing to use technology integrated into their daily life to do things like planning and um, setting up small groups of family members. You know, like people who look at technology as, oh, that would make me more productive. Our listeners, probably. And yes, our listeners, degree. probably. Yeah. Yep. Prosumers. So, Prosumers, uh, yeah. I, I I've always thought that a consumer version of Microsoft 365 would happen. and You did? The reason yeah. it, yeah. And uh, if you look at it at a very simplistic level, just renaming Office 365 to Microsoft 365 would make some mm -hmm. sense because of the brand and so forth. But when you think sure. about the kind of consumer services you can add in, mm -hmm. um, in addition to the ones that you found out about, some of the ones I would, I would want to see in this would be A, Windows 10 Pro, because that gets you out of the hellscape of having to install every update as it comes down if you want that, which I think is super mm. important. Mm -hmm. Getting rid of ads. You mentioned something about MSN apps and so forth. Yep. Um, how about getting rid of the ads in Windows, right, across yep. the board? I, I would pay for that. Um, and then I, there's some integration possibilities, I think, with some of their uh, gaming properties like Xbox Live. Um, yeah. That I, I know are not gaming. in there. No, no, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm more speaking to what I think could be part of it, not that what is mm. going to be part of it. Like in other words, okay. when you think okay. about Microsoft for consumers, you know, Office 365 Home today is this no-brainer thing for families. Mm -hmm. um, adding Xbox Live, with when you think about all the parental components that go there, I think, it, uh, you know, like the family, uh, well, Microsoft family capabilities yeah. uh, falls right into that. 
and would be kind mm-hmm. of neat. So yeah, I think it makes Maybe. sense. Yeah, it, they might do that. I mean, they have they already have a subscription program for Xbox, which is Xbox Game Pass, right? Mm-hmm. And they already have Office 365 Pro, uh, Home and Home and uh, Personal, as you mentioned. The part they don't have is like a bundle of all the other stuff. Like they've dabbled with that before. Remember, I forget what they call yes. those. We've, yes, we've written about yes, them before. Yes, yes. That's right. Like here's, um, you know, a Xbox uh, Gaming Pass plus this plus this for a What was that thing called? Someone, in, someone will remember this and who's watching uh, yeah. the show. Uh, so it might it like? be like the next version of that in a way, right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But sold as a subscription bundle. And, you know, like not just a one time, we, we have a limited number of these things. Instead, it's well, like I every mean, year. Blah, if blah, you blah. Think, look, look at the cost of um, Office 365 Home Day, it's about $100 a year. Yep. Mm-hmm. And it's not on sale. It gives you all the, whatever the benefits are for Office and mm-hmm. OneDrive storage and everything. If you threw in Windows 10 Pro for everyone who did that, even if you can't take it away, right? I mean, like you can't yeah. really downgrade someone from Pro to Home, hopefully. Um, yeah. But that would be a neat way, even if some someone paid for it for the one year and they were able mm-hmm. to apply that to all of their PCs and then they went away from it for whatever reason, I, mm-hmm. it would still be a huge benefit. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, hmm. I, that's all I know. I've already had some people say to me, so does this mean Microsoft's not going to make Windows free anymore for home users? No, this is not what that means. Gordon Kelly from Forbes. Um, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Microsoft this, this, just revealed a nasty surprise for Windows. <laughs> this this is more just like Microsoft 365, I believe. It's going to be an option. It's a, a sub, sub, blah, it's hard to say that. Subscription bundle option. It's not forcing everybody to be on the subscription bundle. So you decide right. if it makes sense for you. Yeah, you can't. I mean, you could right. force people to be on <laughs> So, But yeah, no. yeah right. Yeah, but just throwing the word at, of caution. <laughs> well, but look at it as a, it, it's like any bundle. If you were going to buy mm-hmm. some of this stuff anyway and getting this is less expensive and you get this other stuff, you know, that's the value. Right. So Office 365 by itself is already an incredible value. If you can add stuff to it and have it cost the same and not be that much more expensive, that may make sense to some people. Also, uh, I would say on the corporate side, especially the way it was originally introduced, you could think of logically Microsoft 365 as being one or more uh, premium tiers of Office 365 Mm -hmm. because it's a superset of what you get with Office 365. Yeah. Yep. Well, that's going to be – so when is that happening? Or is it just a rumor or is it real? Oh, we just They've got job posts. <laughs> job, well, there are job postings ah. in um, in their job boards that make it seem like they're already on their way to building this. Well, on their way. Hmm. Right. I know who knows. Chris Capicella knows. We haven't seen him in a while. We really ought to get him yeah. back on the show. It's been, it's been like, almost a year, been, hasn't it? It has. Yeah, yeah. We need we need our Santa mm. to come back. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Or in my case, my my own personal Jesus. <laughs> um, I'm joking. I'm like joking. The Patch Mode Santa. song. Yeah, or it's a Dep- was it? Yeah, yeah, it was, wasn't it? Or Depeche Mode? Depeche Mode? Yeah. Or was it REM? <laughs> I confuse those. Uh, no, it wasn't REM. It was uh, Depeche Mode. Anyway. You're right. Yeah. Hardware time. That was the hardware news. The Snapdragon Eight CX. Yeah. So last week, uh, Qualcomm held their annual Snapdragon Summit in Hawaii. And uh, I, uh, both of us declined not to go, actually, um, because it what? takes 200. Well, I know. It's too far. It, it's Hawaii. such a long flight. Hawaii. I, uh, I know. I did days. it last year. It's one of the, it's, it is one of those most magical places I've ever been. It was wonderful. But, um, you know, they stream their stuff and they gave us the information ahead of time, whatever. But um, they had a bunch of stuff around 5G, which is awesome. And the Snapdragon 855, which is for phones, also awesome. But I think the thing we should uh, focus on today is the 8CX, which is their... Technically, a second generation chipset developed specifically for PCs. It's the third Snapdragon chipset to appear in PCs, right? In these Windows. So is this 10 a thing our... that was called 1000 at one point? Snapdragon yep. 1000. This is the same chip, right? Yep, it is. And okay. what they're promising now, these we're not going to see these devices until the third quarter of next year. So we've got a ways to go here. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what they're promising is Core i5 level performance, which 
answers one of the two major problems with Windows 10 ARM, the other one being compatibility with 64-bit desktop apps. Um, the platform already gets incredible uh, battery life to 20 to 25 hours, depending on the system. Credible uh, connectivity. Uh, today, it's gigabit plus LTE. Great standby times, et cetera. Uh, but the performance has been terrible. So, you know, first generation A35-based uh, Windows 10 ARM PCs were unusable, basically. Um, they were terrible. But since then, they've announced the 850, which is based on the 845. It's for PCs. It's some minor, kind of modest uh, upgrades. I'm testing one of those systems right now. And I got to say, actually, I think this one slides in under the minimum bar there from a performance perspective. Mm. It is a dramatic improvement. Um which isn't saying much. The first one was terrible, but I think it's actually usable. Um, so I'll I, I did some performance testing on it. It's it's good. You know, it, it's fine. It's not. It's is not it as, is it as fast as the Go? It's faster than the Go. Good. Yeah. That's yeah. even though that's Intel. That's kind of a. Pace I think up. this is what yeah. they yeah. wanted to use for the Go, and I I, ah. I just think they had to have the design done right so early. Also, there's some. I don't know if you guys know know about this or if we've ever talked about this, but. Did you know that the Surface Go was not designed by Microsoft in-house? Well, they actually farmed this. it out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was actually, they, they farmed it out to a small, they basically said, look, we need to cost reduce the pro, yeah. do that. That's and some other company did, did it nice for job. them. So. It, I think it's a very Was it Pegatron? Who yeah, was it? It, it was like somebody like that, right? Yeah. It was like so one of these original design you've manufacturers. Seen the, yep. You've seen the story about the magnets, right? And how there's an odd magnet configuration in the Go that looks like it's maybe intended to have two Go's attached together to form yeah. a book. Yep. Yeah. So did you talk let me about ask that last you, week. No. So what? Mm. I, I forget what Tim Cook said, but what did two turkeys make again? I can't remember. <laughs> like, they don't make an eagle. What? We know that. A refrigerator yeah, like, toaster. <laughs> I think we're. I think there's a little too much emphasis going into this. Uh, Surface Go <laughs> is the first Surface. Pro type device since Surface Pro 3 to have a different keyboard uh, cover mm -hmm. connector. Um, it's wider. It has so it has more connectivity to it, possibly for extra functions. Could that mean connecting two Surface Go's together for for two really mm -hmm. slow sides of a computer? I don't know. I, I don't understand why you would ever do that with that computer. Yeah. But uh, it's not paper thin or anything. I mean, it's you know, it's mm -hmm. it's small and light. I get it, but it's not. It's not like you could hold it there in one hand with two of them. You know, in a V. Shape thing, so I don't quite understand that theory. But um, I also lost track. What the heck we were talking about? So, but <laughs> the uh, but oh, to get up, but go back to the, and, back to the yeah. Snapdragon thing. So allegedly, the eight C. So where I guess the um, the Snapdragon eight fifty allegedly has uh, a thirty percent performance improvement over the eight thirty five. Um, according to the benchmarks I've run. It's in the 20 to 24% range, but those benchmarks are mm. semi-pointless because one's a store app and the other one's an emulated app and whatever. But I did run them on both 835 and 850 to come up with some math. But the Snapdragon 8CX is supposed to be like a 2x performance mm. over its predecessor. So that could actually be meaningful. Um, mm. So we'll have to, we're going to have to wait. You know, it's going to be nine months yeah. before we see one. But if you think about... Uh, What's that event in August? I think it's in Berlin, maybe, where they announce new hardware. IFA. IFA. IFA, yeah. 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 Um, that is where the, there's only one 850-based PC out in the world so far. This is the Lenovo Yoga C630. That was announced there, I believe. But if not, it was announced around that time frame. So I think that's the logical time frame next year for Snapdragon 8CX PC. So mm. we'll see. The other thing is, I don't think you said this, um, it runs Windows 10 Enterprise. The, the HCX, right? Oh. The HCX runs um, Windows 10 Enterprise. I don't I don't think it means that every PC that ships with this chip will ship with no, that. I think what but it, it can run will, it because the other versions yeah, bringing, of Snapdragon could not. Oh, right? really? What is there in Enterprise that requires? Well, I, mean, I think it just power-wise, right? Oh, wow. I don't. I, I think the right way to think of it is not so much that they couldn't, but that they didn't. In other words, okay, yeah. the initial generations were offered to consumers, so they ran mm -hmm. the consumer SKU, whatever. You know, the first one was Windows 10 mm -hmm. S, and then for this one, it's Windows 10 Home and S mode for some reason. Yeah. Um, I think what they're trying to say is there will be enterprise uh, Windows 10 enterprise based PCs based on this oh, platform okay. next year. I just thought maybe it wasn't even powerful enough because I mean, enterprise does have more features and I would think more 
power requirements. Uh, no. But anyway, I mean, they it's, make it available, it's but I, I yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, interesting. Yeah. How does Chrome run on a uh, ARM <laughs> processor? Not good. Not good. Not, good. not well. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever well, try it on called, the HP I, NVX2? It was like, mm, uh, that's a good one. So, <laughs> related to this news, actually, I should mention, uh, Qualcomm is working to bring Chromium and Firefox to, as native ARM64 apps on Windows 10 and ARM. Now, that will be huge because yep. those apps will run natively and they'll run great. So, that that's... I, I mentioned the, the two big issues with uh, Snapdragon for Windows users uh, have been performance, which they're solving, and app compat, which is a tough one. Uh, getting those browsers solves a big chunk of that compatibility problem right there. It doesn't help with things like Photoshop. You know, Photoshop Elements even, which is in the store, cannot run on Snapdragon-based PCs. Mm -hmm. So they've allegedly talked to Adobe. They obviously have nothing to announce along those lines. I suspect it's a little more complicated than flipping a switch in a box and recompiling. But um, if they could get some of that stuff, uh, that's a big hump to get over. Mm -hmm. Huh. Mm -hmm. This is very interesting. Yeah. And actually, this the whole end stuff is tied to this. It is. Uh, yeah. It's kind of interesting. Because it's going to be an arm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, Neowin, Neowin reported um, this week that they believe the the next version of HoloLens will include the Snapdragon 850 in addition to Microsoft's custom holographic processor. That's how you improve battery life, I guess, and maybe. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. And weight, maybe, and size. Well, the reason that yep. makes sense, think about what HoloLens is, right? It's a Windows 10 platform. It, it's disconnected, so it, it you know it's not tethered. So battery life really matters. It doesn't run desktop apps, so the, all, that problem I just mentioned doesn't matter to Hololens. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is it's genius. This is this is exactly the right yep. platform for Hololens. It is, and if it's true, it means the Hololens is, is an always connected PC, which is kind of an interesting thing to think about, yeah. right? <laughs> uh, well, is it? I mean, does, does yeah. it, it would have to have an eSIM, wouldn't it? Or I mean, it it means it could, right? Could and be, it yeah. and yeah. Um, that's kind of interesting if it does. Right, right. I mean, it's well, already a standalone you, computer. The Hololens goggles yeah. are already a standalone Windows 10 computer, but I think this would make that even more kind of interesting. And how long is it before with, we see one on a plane? I know. You know, some well, guys you know, people wear like the Gear <laughs> VR and the Oculus Go yeah. on planes to watch movies, which I still think. Is a recipe for I, disaster. I just want to alert the world right now that I fly a lot. And if I ever see someone doing that, I am going to decorate their cabin space with every bit of trash I can what, find. What? what happened? So that when they wake up out of their little <laughs> VR coma, <laughs> they can find like a tower of those mini drink cans in front of them or whatever. <laughs> Or just yeah. order him uh, five drinks and have them all on the tray there when he gets out. <laughs> yes. Mm. Right. Wow. I don't know. The 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 idea of it being an, an always connected PC kind of fits in with Microsoft's strategy of repositioning the HoloLens as a business computer, right? Because yeah. if you look at what they're really promoting for HoloLens these days, it's all these business apps like Remote Assist and Microsoft, um, that mm. 3D design one. Um, I forget the name of that one now, but uh, the, it, it and Microsoft also has said always connected PCs are the future of business devices from their standpoint. So this kind of all brings it home again that HoloLens is part of their business device strategy, even though it started out more as kind of a frivolous gaming type thing. A frivolous gaming type thing. <laughs> I um, That was an interesting way to put it. You know, you just notepad, I'm going to disc frivolous gaming stuff. I didn't disc Notepad. I, I dissed Microsoft's inability to do for the rest of Windows what they're doing to Notepad. I'm kidding. Sort of. How about Cortana? Any Cortana <laughs> news? I know everybody's yeah. waiting for the big Cortana segment. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, yes. this is one we of those. We almost the show like, this week in Cortana. Yeah. We yeah, almost did. That close. We almost did. That close. Yeah. Um, so uh, this is a feature that is not in Cortana yet, 
which a lot of people are like, it's not, uh, but it seems to be coming soon. Uh, Cortana c- cannot currently distinguish between multiple voices um, and recognize multiple voices, but a couple of users um, have been tweeting over the past few days that they're starting to see these buttons pop up, um, one of them on a Windows 10 PC, another one on an iOS device that makes it appear that Microsoft is about to enable this for Cortana and that you can train up to six different um It'll recognize up to six different voices and users and be able to distinguish between them. So, Jeez, yeah, to, it's good. To keep up with uh, 2014 there. Um, <laughs> well, Alexa, <laughs> Alexa only got this um, in 2017, yes. I think. Um, so, okay, they're a year behind. I'm surprised they're doing it, um, to be Me honest. Too. Because the, the situations in which Cortana is actually used, someone's computer when wait. you're signed in, or your mm-hmm. phone, yep. it's not a multi-user environment. You know? yep. Yep. It's it's enabled for the Harman Kardon, which not many people have. But they've also, you know, in Brad's book, and we've heard too, that there could be another speaker coming, possibly from Microsoft, some kind of an, or some kind of an ambient device that uses Cortana in an integrated way. So maybe it's setting up for that, you know, like some kind of a meeting scenario. Right. We don't know. They did just release Surface doing- headphones. Yeah, you know, I suppose speakers are not yeah. an impossibility. So you, you said something I thought was it. Somebody we know has written a book. Yes. Yeah, it's pretty somebody darn has. exciting. It's called Microsoft <laughs> 2.0. I mean, that's, that's a collector's item, man. That's like over a decade old now. Yeah, sure. well, notice the price, 50 cents, cheap. Yes. So <laughs> It's amazing they're still selling it at all. <laughs> this, is, this is Mary Jo. Fo- I love it because you can tell it's Bill Gates on the front. Yep. The Microsoft awesome. 3.0 book is going to have to have a silhouette of Gates in a wheelchair. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is awesome. This is awesome. Mm-hmm. Sean uh, is visiting us from uh, Marina and down down south and uh, in the Monterey area, and he. Mary Jo Foley writes. Robert Scoble, a list blogger, is Ms. Microsoft. <laughs> See, that totally uh, dates this book, yeah, doesn't she, it? Yeah, she, a list blogger. Uh, sure. She seems to know everyone that's going on, everything that's everyone and everything that's going on at one Microsoft. Let's see who else do you have. Ed Bot, award-winning technology writer. When I want to know what we write one Microsoft way, isn't it O N E? It is. Oh, Robert. Yes. Back to the presses. And then somebody named Mini <laughs> Mini Microsoft says Ms. Foley does right. a fabulous job. Whatever happened to Mini Microsoft? Is that, was that a blog? No, was there was a, a guy, Mini yeah, Microsoft. Um, he wrote a blog where employees could go and vent about things going uh, on internally at the company. It was very popular, and he wrote the forward to my book. We, don't, even. we called them. And little, then there was a drone Microsoft strike, and we never heard from him again. <laughs> <laughs> Look no, at he's this. a real guy. I know who he is, but I was sworn to secrecy. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Lots of footnotes, Mary Jo. Looks like she can't Man. write a page without footnotes. And Glad. there was a ton of um, material backing it up that I put online only, oh. and I don't think that that exists anymore. Did, that archive um, of that. Did Microsoft <laughs> add a footnote footnote capability to Notepad to enable this? <laughs> or that yes, they did. What? No. Oh, no. I didn't. I didn't write my book in OneNote. I wrote my book in Word, as, had as I recall. The publisher makes yeah. you do that. That's really yeah. Amazing. Do you still have to do that, Paul, or have they moved on? Well, I, I do self-publishing now, so the you can do it the, anything you want. You do it in well. Page the company maker. I use actually publishes with Lean. I'm um, sorry, with um, Markdown. So I, I use oh, Markdown nice. Right. You write in Markdown. Wow. Yep. How do you do like that in Markdown? A, a, a little pull quote like that. It's just you could use styles if you wanted oh, to. So cool. the the publisher actually has custom styles for things oh, like that. That's really neat. So we have uh, tips and secrets and whatever they. You know, whatever. So compare this fine book. In actual right. hardcover form, to this, this is the <laughs> book we're talking about. Brad Sam's "Beneath a Surface: The Inside Story of How Microsoft Overcame a Nine Hundred Million Dollar Write Down to Become the Hero of the PC Industry." Look at this. Yeah, so looks got, good. I got I got two copies. I'm auctioning off. Actually, you know, I'll trade you, Sean. I will trade you one <laughs> Brad Sam's for one Mary Jo Foley. Wait, wait, wait. What's the, what's wow. the price on the cover of that book? <laughs> 50 cents? Jeez. Oh, he says he already has uh, Brad's book. Damn it. Look, he's there he is with Clippy. That's yep. funny. By the way, Clippy, uh, it doesn't smell so good in there. What is it? 
Is it? It's a it's a wearable clippy suit. Oh God! Did you put it on? No, but Brad did. Remember, we had him on the show one time when we were at uh, Build. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, man. It was, uh... He was stuck in there for hours. Oh. <laughs> did he make it? You know, it's like when uh, Darth Vader was stuck in the TIE fighter at the end of the Star Wars. <laughs> and he was stuck out there in space. Forever. Yeah. Oh. Not good. Anyway. That was at a Build like two years ago, right? That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So um, I want a picture of him so I can put him in the... Uh... In the show. Um, where do we get this uh, fine book beneath the surface? At, at better bookstores everywhere. If you say that, then no one will ever get a copy. It's actually not at better bookstores, but no. you can get it online. Good. Just Google Beneath the Surface by Brad Sams. Yeah. And don't forget. I think it's beneathasurface.com probably. Mary Jo Foley, Microsoft 2.0, how Microsoft plans to stay relevant in the post-Gates era. Were you right, back, by the way, Mary Jo? Do you look back on this and say, yeah, I, I nailed it? You know what's crazy? A lot of the things I have in there happened. Yep. Um, so I was like, wow, that's nice. pretty crazy. <laughs> nice. Not everything, yeah. but yeah. Actually, I, I told Brad when he was working on his book, you know, he was a little concerned about the the chap, the last chapters about what's going to happen in the future. And he's like, this is going to be really dated in six months or a year. And I'm like, no, I said, this is going to be fascinating. It's just like Mary Jo's book. You you make these predictions or you tell these insider stories about what what's going to happen. And it's yep. it's always interesting to go back and see how it either it did is. happen or what might have changed or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I don't think that dates the book at all. No. No. I want to point out, I offered uh, Sean a dollar for it, with doubling his mm -hmm. investment, and he still turned it down. Wow. Sure. And I, we have to say, Leo, Leo's a little low on funds thank to, <laughs> thanks to a certain <laughs> alcohol purchase. Uh, don't mention that. <laughs> Probably as high as you can go. So yeah, that's probably true. Um, all right, Mary Jo, time to uh, take a break because it's all about Paul for the next three hours. Xbox it's time. Fine. Finally, finally. No, it's, uh, <laughs> do we have Xbox news? I don't even remember. Yeah, Xbox Plus video um, games. Usually, right at the end of a month, Microsoft will come out with a blog post where they say, "Hey, look, we've got these five new games that are coming to Xbox Game Pass." in the next month, you know, because they release new games to Xbox Game Pass every month. And they did that. And then uh, December happened and they made another announcement. Then they made another announcement. And then last week they announced five more games. Like they just keep announcing that, like this has been kind of a, a bonanza uh, month. And this is the month uh, that, of course, PUBG has come to uh, Xbox Game Pass as well. So just a kind of a reminder of what a, what a great value that is and that it just keeps getting better. Um, and then I don't, I, my kids are not young enough to benefit from this particular story, but Microsoft has, uh, something called Microsoft family, which is like their parental controls service that is up in the cloud. They have it on the Xbox and, uh, they've enabled settings that are related to cross play. So if you're, there are certain games like Fortnite where you can play against people on other consoles or other platforms, you can enforce, uh, parental controls on those for your kids. If you don't want them to see or do certain things. And actually, Fortnite is the first game that supports that uh, functionality. I think it's available now. Very nice. And then finally, um, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I've spent a few minutes uh, playing Black Ops 4 um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. this year. He is Prestige actually. 29. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I'm, I don't know where I am, 4. Maybe. 4. But uh, I, this game has been, is fascinating. This newest game is fascinating on a number of levels because um, it just came out in October, which is earlier than usual. It was the best-selling video game of October and already is the best-selling video game of the entire year. Wow. But it's it was semi-controversial at launch because they did not include a single-player campaign, which obviously has not held it back in the slightest. In fact, the Call of Duty single-player campaigns have been going downhill, in my opinion. And the real value to these games, I think, is in the replay. You can play multiplayer online um, against other people or with other people. And that's obviously been a, a big hit, and they've added a Battle Royale game as well. So what they just did was they announced a new version of it that is just multiplayer, meaning all the traditional multiplayer modes, plus um, Black, I think it's called Blackout, the uh, Battle Royale mode, for $30. You know, typically this game would sell for 60 So the thing you're not getting is the Zombies game uh, that's also built into this game. And if you find you want it later, you can actually upgrade it to it. So it's kind of like a cheap new way to buy the game, but it's it's PC only, for one thing I should say. You can't get it on the console. But if you just want to play the multiplayer stuff, meaning traditional multiplayer plus blackout, uh, you can get the game now for 30 bucks. That's an incredible deal. 
and you should get it. You should get Actually, it. Actually, you should get, you should get the get whole it. thing. I want to get it. Except that the zombie mode is the only thing that Michael likes to play. No, then you can't get that. I can't get it. You get the, get the big one. Got to get the big boy version. I spend 120 bucks to play Call of Duty Jeez. every year because you have. I, well, I buy the DLC, <laughs> you get all which the is DLC. another six dollars. Yeah. But based on the amount of time I play it, oh, I think I actually make your money's worth. I make money. Yeah. yeah I mean, it's, you're actually making money playing it's, games. It's a it's a side hustle for me. <laughs> <laughs> hey kid, wow! <laughs> play it for a quarter. Just just <laughs> just for the taunting alone. <laughs> Let's take a break. Then, our, uh, believe it or not, that was not our tip or pick of the week, but that's coming up. And uh, beer, too. But first, a word from our sponsor. This was, uh, boy, was this a welcome thing in the studio uh, last few weeks. The Molecule Air Purifier. You know, we had more fires in California. The fire in uh, Paradise just blew straight here. We couldn't breathe. The air quality was over 200 for more than two weeks. I would actually uh, stay inside. And, you know, they say stay inside, but if you don't have pure air inside, and I don't understand why that would work. Fortunately, we have molecules everywhere. We have them here in the studio. We have them at home. It started actually in our bedroom. Lisa was waking up with headaches. She had never had allergies before, but when we moved to the country, I think there was a lot more dust and pollen. So we got a molecule. Molecule is the world's first molecular air purifier. Uh, it's, it is not a, a, a filter that captures and stores pollutants. It actually destroys them. Destroys pollutants at a molecular level. This replaces 50 years of what, what is now really antiquated air purify, purification technology, the HEPA filter. That was developed in the 40s. Haven't really been anything changed since. It's just a filter that traps large particles and keeps them. That's not what the molecule does. Well, it does capture, uh, uh, it has a filter to capture stuff, but then it also captures and eliminates, destroys allergens, mold, bacteria, viruses, airborne chemicals, the VOCs that come off of, you know, like formaldehyde that comes off carpets or, or uh, VOCs that come off paint. These are pollutants a thousand times smaller than those a HEPA filter can capture. Molecule makes it easier to cope with asthma, allergies, reduces symptoms. Lisa stopped waking up with a headache, and I know it was working because uh, when we would travel, she'd get the headache again when we went to San Francisco. So I knew it was making a difference. That's why we got a second molecule for Michael. Our whole house now is purified, and then we got a third molecule for the studio. Did you know that mold and bacteria can actually live and grow in HEPA filters? You're making a collection. That's the problem. <laughs> You're collecting pollutants. Go to the website, M-O-L-E-K-U-L-E.com, and see what the molecule does that's different. Molecules technology was funded by the EPA. It has been extensively tested not only by people like us, but verified by third parties in university laboratories. The U University of South Florida's Center for Biological Defense. The University of Minnesota's Particle Calibration Laboratory. Molecule's easy to use. It's got a clean, sleek design. It lets you know when it needs new filters. It's got a beautiful solid aluminum shell. And uh, because of the filter subscription service, I'm, I, you know, filters regularly arrive when I need them which is really awesome. I love our molecule. It's the apple of air purifiers. Probably shouldn't say that on a Windows show. That'll make people think the wrong thing. It is beautifully designed. It works well. You can connect it to your Wi-Fi network, control it remotely from your smartphone. I do that. They have a variety of modes. You, you set up the size of the room. You'll get notifications. There's, a, there's, a, uh, there's actually a light, the, uh, a blue light that destroys the... Uh, you know, the tiny little uh, molecules. It's really cool. But if you don't want to use the Bluetooth or Wi-Fi capabilities, you don't have to use them to operate. It's got a button right on the top that'll do everything. I have. I happen to like it, having a, a Wi-Fi connection. For $75 off your first order, go to Molecule.com and use our promo code TWIT75. TWIT75. M-O-L-E-K-U-L-E.com. Promo code TWIT75. Take it from me. It really works. And, of course, even when there's not fires nearby, even when the air outside is fine, we keep the molecule running because 
Uh, we're, we're in a windowless office. So we need it. This, is, this solves the whole problem of sick offices and all of that. Molecule.com. Promo code TWIT75 at checkout. Now, Mr. Therat, your tip of the week. Yeah, I just wanted to tell everyone about the Microsoft Open Source Stories website, which just went up recently. It has, I think, three stories, three stories right now. Uh, they're going to add approximately 20 more, but it's basically stories from people within Microsoft who are moving products to open source. Wow. So they have a story about the Roslyn C Sharp compiler, the .NET Foundation, and um, Python. Um, and uh, I think Mary, Mary Jo, you probably know Dimitri Lee Allen, but he is oh, the guy. I know Dimitri Lee Allen. And you know, okay, so he's you, behind this. He wrote a Twit app for us. He's great. Okay. I yeah, mean, he is. So he's the he guy. He's a, a listener. That's awesome. Yeah, kind of making this happen. So really cool. Worth reading. I put each one of those into pocket and, you know, kind of read them on my on my own time oh, that's later. That's so but, cool. Uh, Dimitri, yeah. congratulations. That's fantastic. <laughs> he's a regular. That's the, he listens to uh, your show every week. That's the sun setting on proprietary software, by the way. The, oh, is that what that is? I was wondering. I just thought it was a pretty picture. <laughs> Paul always likes the illustrations. It's, really, it's the graphic designer yeah. in him. Yeah, you got to look for the subtext. Um, and then uh, this is a, a kind of a bonus tip. Uh, we've talked a lot about Microsoft Edge today and the new Microsoft Edge that's coming. If you want to get involved in testing this product, and I oh, assume this will I be would. available across all supported Windows versions as well as Mac OS, um, you can join the Microsoft Edge Insider program now, right? So this will be for the standalone application version that's based on Chromium. How would I do that, Mr. Theron? Yeah, how would you do that? There's a link in the article, but let me uh, <laughs> let me find the. I probably just could uh, Bing Microsoft. Yeah, it's, it's Edge literally Insider. Microsoft Edge Insider dot com program. Oh, okay, that's easy to find. Easy, yep. Yeah, oh, I'm definitely want to do that. Yep. And then Leo has alluded to this at least twice in this podcast, and it is awesome. Um, if you're an Office 365 subscriber using Office on the Mac, you will get an update this week, today possibly, that will upgrade you to the latest version, which adds support for dark mode, which, by the way, looks awesome How on the Mac. How dark so. is it? It's dark, Leo. It's really dark. <laughs> <laughs> no, it looks, it looks very natural. So if you're used to uh, – I, I prefer dark mode now. I can't, I, I can't not use dark mode like on Windows or the Mac. I love it. And it's particularly good on the Mac, and uh, this just helps Office blend in better with this new dark mode. So yeah. I think it looks great. Yeah, I actually turned off dark mode in Mojave. How dare you? I don't. I like. I don't know. <laughs> I, was, I was getting depressed. Really? Oh wow! I love it. I, I actually. I, I. I find it. Do you to sit be... in the dark when you're writing? Well. <laughs> <laughs> uh <-huh>. Okay. <laughs> And it's now time, ladies and gentlemen, for the Enterprise Pick of the Week. Mary Jo Foley. It's kind of a warning pick. Uh-oh. Something not um, to do? Something you need to be aware of if you happen to use Azure Container Service, ACS. So back in 2017, Microsoft unveiled this thing called the Azure Container Service. Um. It was around the time container technology started getting really popular and they wanted to make an easy way for people to access that. Then last year, they introduced something called Azure Container Service, but that was, uh, but it was AKS instead of ACS. And what that was, was a dedicated Kubernetes service that Microsoft built. Oh. When they introduced AKS, I asked them, hey, is AKS going to supersede ACS? And they said, we don't have anything to say about that. Uh, it turns out it is. And if you're using ACS, you need to get off of that service before January 2020 because it's going away. Microsoft's just going to cease supporting it. And if you've got anything stored in there, you're going to be out of luck. So uh, I wrote a post this week about the suggested migration paths if you're using Docker or if you're using Mesosphere on the current ACS. If you're using Kubernetes on ACS, it's kind of easy to move over to AKS. Uh, but you need to do that fairly soon since the last date of support for ACS is January 31, 2020. There you have it. Uh-oh. I mean, it's, it's not surprising, but... It was one of those things that was kind of like pulling teeth to get them to acknowledge this was going to happen and to get a date. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Kubernetes is coming to DigitalOcean, so there are places you could go. But uh, if you're an mm -hmm. Azure person, 
This is yeah. uh, an important change. It is. And uh, you have a uh, code name for us? I do. This is a code name from the vault, as we say. Um, since we talked so much about Edge at the start of the show, I was thinking, you know what? Let's look back at when we first found out about Edge. Uh, the first thing I could find was an article I wrote back in 2014 uh, where we knew Microsoft was developing a new version of a browser to go into Windows 10. We thought and originally this was IE 11, like a, a customized version of that for Windows 10. Turned out it was Edge. Oh, how interesting. And the, uh, I know. The original codename for Edge was Spartan. I do remember so that. We knew the, yeah. yeah, we knew the codename Spartan, but we didn't know what it was. <laughs> Um, we were kind of like being, oh, what is it? It's supposed to be, um, I, I was looking at my article, it said, they want to make Spartan look and feel more like Chrome and Firefox, um, which is kind of ironic that we wrote that back in 2014. <laughs> wow. Yep. Wow. Um, but yeah, uh, why was it called Spartan? I'm not sure, but that, I remember writing many an article talking about Spartan and we were, we didn't know then what the rendering engine was because Microsoft said at the time it was going to be a brand new rendering engine, nothing to do with Trident, which wasn't true. It was actually a fork of Trident, oh, yeah, which was that. HTML. Yes, 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 I remember. Yep. Yeah. So it was like pulling teeth at, at like from those guys, like, come on, what is this thing you're building? And now they're kind of rebuilding it, even though it will still be called Edge in the future. It now will be Chromium. There you have it. Full circle. Makes me want a beer. Me too. So I, I uh, made today's beer pick something that reflects on one of Paul's <laughs> Xbox tips. <laughs> this is Paul's beer. Speaking of Black Ops 4, um, <laughs> there is a beer called Black Ops. Um, it's from Brooklyn Brewing, and it's a Russian Imperial Stout. It's uh, just called Brooklyn Black Ops. I have had this beer many times. It's delicious. It's aged in bourbon barrels. It's really potent. And it just has all the things you like in a bourbon barrel beer. Chocolatey, a little coffee, a little vanilla, um, so a sipping beer for the holidays for sure. I just had the 2012 variant of that this weekend um, at a beer tasting. And it was even more delicious because it had been aged. But it, the 2018 version's out now and it also is quite good. So if you've never tried Brooklyn Black Ops and you can find it, I would recommend you try it. We should probably say you know kids it's not okay to uh, drink and teabag i should um, save that you did oh no muted. you're unmuted something. now i didn't want you no, I, I, I just well i wanted to tell mary joe she i'm sorry remember I, this yes. the the early windows 10 um code names were all halo related remember oh, threshold right. yep. was the original yep. version of windows oh, so 10 sparta so spartan spartan is the yeah. the type of soldier that that's master right. Chief right. that's right that's right that's right um, I think. Yep. By the way, this Black Ops is ten and a half percent. Yeah, it's yeah, not. It's like not a light beer. beer should, <laughs> like any good beer. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> not a light uh, beer. I'm sorry. Yeah, I had. I accidentally hit your microphone. No, no, it's okay. I just. <laughs> Maybe it's because you were in the left channel. That's it. Yeah. Do it. Do it. Uh, Do it. Paul Thorat. <laughs> he's at Thorat.com. His books are at LeanPub.com, and you must buy. The Windows 10 Field Guide right now. You've got Mary Jo Foley's oh. Microsoft 2.0. You've got Brad Sam's Beneath the Surface. Why don't you have the Windows you know, 10 Field Guide for you people up. who have written one book are cute. But... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, congratulations, guys. <laughs> Mary Jo Foley writes at least a book a week at allaboutmicrosoft.com. And uh, you should follow her there. That's her ZDNet blog. Each Wednesday, we convene, the three of us, at about 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 1900 UTC, for this little thing we call Windows Weekly. <laughs> A little podcast we call Windows Weekly. If you want to watch it live, you go to twit.tv slash live. If you want to uh, listen live, you can go there, too. We've got both live uh, video and audio streams. If you do that, though, I encourage you to visit the chat room as well, IRC. Dot twit dot TV. You could join the wags <laughs> in the back of the class there. IRC yeah. dot twit dot TV. Um, on demand audio and video of the show is also always available either at our website, twit.tv slash WW, or best thing to do, subscribe in your favorite podcast application. That way you'll get it automatically the minute it's available. Just look for Windows Weekly. You can even ask your 
your Cortana or other virtual assistant to play Windows Weekly Podcast, and it'll give you the latest version. Like, Are we magic. sure that works with a Cortana? Does I that don't work? know. I've never tried it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm taking it as mm -hmm. given, but I could be wrong. <clears throat> does, mm -hmm. does Cortana not play? Uh, it plays music, doesn't it? Sure it does. It does. <laughs> He's being sarcastic. We, Back to sarcastic, with Paul. Spotify. So Spotify does podcasts. I suppose anything it is possible. It might work. It's possible. Yeah. It's possible. <laughs> uh, Paul, Mary Jo, have a wonderful week. Next Thank week, you. will we have a visitation from uh, somebody up north? I think we Santa may. Santa Claus? In Santa fact. <laughs> yes. Oh, is it going to spoil it? Yep. All right. So make sure you, you don't want to miss it. It's also kind of a special episode, episode 600. And our right? last one of the year. And the last show of the year. So, golly, if if you're missing this show, that's one thing. But don't miss next, next week. Hmm. Of course, if you're missing this show, you didn't know I even said that. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time on Windows Weekly. Bye-bye.